Alright, so it's been an entire year since I've logged into this training machine. The first thing we need to figure out is the password. So let's try it. Pass? Okay, nope, that's not it. Uh, how about password? Nope, alright, that's not it either. Uh, let's try password1. Okay, that's not it. Um, oh, I think I might know what it might be. It's a uh, password1 with an exclamation mark at the end. There you go. Alright, I should probably write that down real quick. Before we get started on this episode, I just wanted to thank my sponsor, Digital Fire Team, your experts on IT support. For more information, please visit digitalfireteam.com or follow them on Twitter at DigiFireTeam. No one ever thinks twice about changing their four-year-old password. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? This is true to most people, at least until someone accesses your account when they clearly should not have been able to. And then you think, oh boy, what was wrong with my password? It might not have been the password, it might have been something else. But the possibility that it was a password? You gotta think about the guidelines surrounding password policies and why they're implemented in the first place. Every day, attackers guess, brute force, or socially engineer their way into other people's accounts. It's a cycle that repeats itself every day. This isn't anything new either, as many people tend to pick bad passwords or fall into traps that make them victims to all sorts of password attacks. Now, what is a good password? I think plenty of people have been bothered multiple times by various websites that their password needs to be one capital letter, a number, a symbol, or perhaps it just barks at them because their password, password1, is way too similar to password. Good password habits might be a small habit, but one mistake could result in a breach. The first thing you need to understand is that these guidelines are very important for the sake of you and your system security. Second, we need to educate your users on the threat of what the attackers could do and why these habits mitigate the risk. We'll talk about the password habits and what they could potentially protect you from in just a second. Now, a good password would follow these particular guidelines. The password has no relation to you. The password has not been used in the past. The password has one capital letter. The password has one lowercase letter. The password has one number. The password has one symbol. The password contains a length of eight characters or more for standard users. And the password contains a length of 14 characters or more for administrators. Now it might seem like a lot to remember, but believe me, it sticks, especially when you're reminded of it every day. But what do these password guidelines protect you from? These password guidelines can protect you and your users from various types of password attacks. I'd like to clarify these types of attacks as automated, meaning no one will be there constantly. They'll wait for the process to finish and output results. Either way, it's better to have some protection against these kinds of password attacks than none at all. Password guessing is just simply guessing passwords. While this is not an automated process, it's still done the same way as other methods, just manually. This can be used by attackers who have researched their subject in a way to get a better idea of what their password might be. For instance, the victim might use something related to them as a password, as it helps them remember it. But this should be avoided. Brute forcing is the use of an automated program to guess every possible password. Now, this can be hard to do when we're applying all the guidelines above. And I mean that. It might take years, hundreds, or thousands to break into your account. But how long will it be until your password is broken depends on your password strength and many other factors. A dictionary attack is similar to a brute force attack. However, it incorporates a large amount of words and adds them to the process. If your password is a mix of numbers, letters, symbols, rather than words, then it takes a long time to break your password with a dictionary attack. A rainbow table is basically a pre-compiled table for reversing cryptographic hashing functions, which means someone figured out how to break out unique hashes and has a list ready for you to try out. These tables are used in recovering something that has been encoded in a cryptographic function up to a certain length. Even for old cryptographic methods, it might take several terabytes of rainbow tables for things such as NTLM or MD5, but that depends on the length of the password. These are only some of the few basic methods used for breaking into passwords. Fortunately, it can be avoided with a password policy and good password habits. So what do we do now? From this point, our main concern is not how we can change our password, but how we can change everybody's password. When a system is compromised, everyone's password must be changed. 
Passwords would normally be changed then, and once again, right after the system has been fully secured. However, we won't be doing that. What we'll be doing first is enforcing a password policy. A password policy is a set of rules that must be followed for passwords. So before we implement a password policy, we need to figure out how to do that in the first place. You can do this by opening up local security policy. To do this, we need to open it up. You should start by hitting the Windows button and proceeding to type local security policy. Once you've done so, it's going to pop up, right click local security policy, run it as an administrator, and assuming you're on a machine that lets you do this, it should pop up on your screen like this. This is the local security policy. It is an area where a lot of security settings are defined for your system. Now, we'll be talking about password policy and account lockout policy. Here are the recommended settings for the password policy. Enforce password history, 24 passwords remembered. Maximum password age, 30 to 90 days. Minimum password age, 15 days. Minimum password length, eight characters. Password must meet complexity requirements, enabled. Store password using reversible encryption, disabled. Here's my explanation for each setting. Enforce password history. This is to make it so that passwords cannot be reused. Windows only allows a maximum of 24 passwords to be kept on record, and that's plenty. Maximum password age. This varies from account types. We'll mention it very quickly though. User password ages should be 90 days and administrator password ages should be 30 days. What a password age is the maximum days that a password can be active. I recommend you just put something here between 30 to 90 days to keep things simplified. Minimum password age. The minimum password age is used to prevent people from reusing passwords. For instance, when their password history is 24, someone might want to change their password 23 times so that they can reuse their password. This prevents this from happening. Minimum password length. The minimum password length is the minimum amount of characters a password will require to be acceptable. Password must meet complexity requirements. This means that the password must meet at least three complexity requirements that we discussed earlier. Store passwords using reversible encryption. This means that the passwords of the system are stored somewhere and are able to be decrypted. No. Changing passwords can be done in various ways. For example, one of the simplest methods of changing passwords is by using Control Panel. To do so, go to Control Panel, then go to User Accounts, and proceed to click the accounts. You'll receive a list of users on the system. Click the account you'd like to modify and change the password from there. While this method is very practical and simple, it's unfortunately very tedious and inefficient when it comes to speed. The next method, however, is much more efficient as it allows quick and efficient password modification. We'll be introducing our first tool, Microsoft Management Console. The Microsoft Management Console, also known as MMC, is used to modify a variety of settings in one convenient location. How we'll be able to modify passwords is by adding something onto our console called a Snap-in, which is basically a tool you can add onto Microsoft Management Console. The Snap-in is called Local Users and Groups. When you add it into the console, you'll click Users and receive a list of all the users on the system. With the users in a list and ready to be modified, it makes your job much easier. To open Microsoft Management Console, press the Windows button and R at the exact same time. This is going to open up the Run Prompt. From here, just type MMC into the Run Prompt and then press Enter. You should be able to get the Microsoft Management Console open. In addition, you can also press the Home button and look it up in the taskbar. Once you've done so, the Microsoft Management Console should appear. And when it does, click File, Add slash Remove Snap-in, and then from within the list, labeled Available Snap-ins, click the Snap-in Local Users and Groups. Click the Add button and then press OK at the bottom. When finished, you should receive the following. What we were talking about was modifying passwords. For instance, if you right-click a user on the Microsoft Management Console and click Set Password, this will allow you to change their password. You're going to want to do this for all the users affected by the compromise, except for yourself. Because that could lead to some problems mid-competition and you don't want that. That's all I can really say about this section. When it comes to changing passwords, you should use whatever method you're comfortable with, but I'd highly recommend that you practice with all methods, get used to the information you learned, and try getting better with Microsoft Management Console. It might save you in the future. There are other methods you can take to change passwords and other properties with users. However, that'll be discussed much later. So let's go and wrap up everything that we learned. 
We learned about password complexities and how to apply them, the types of attacks that can happen to passwords, how to mitigate some of these risks through security policy, how to open local security policies and apply policies, a standard password policy and why it is implemented, how to open and operate Microsoft Management Console, and what to do when changing passwords. If you liked this episode and want to see the series continue to grow, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing to my channel. When I reach 100 subscribers, I'll have a lot more tools at my fingertips and will be able to release higher quality content. Thank you for sticking around, and I wish the best for you until next time.